All right then, hello everyone. Welcome to this two hour tutorial at uh, Transform 2021. We will be looking at PyVista today with Bain Sullivan. Um, before we get to the uh, the content, I just wanna say thank you to Studio X for supporting this conference. Information about this event you'll find in the links. Uh, well, there's some links in the description uh, below this video in YouTube. Um, if you're watching this live, you can join in the chat on Slack in the uh, Software Underground Slack, softwareunderground.org slash Slack if you're not in there yet. Um, but with that, I'm gonna hand over to Bain Sullivan. He's one of uh, the PyVista developers and uh, he's an R&D engineer at Kitware. Um, but he's joining us today, I think from Colorado, and I'll let him introduce himself if he wants to say anything more about uh, where he is. Cheers, Bain. Thanks, Matt. Um, yep, so hi, everyone. My name is Bain Sullivan. I am one of the co-creators of the PyVista 3D visualization software framework. Um, I'm currently a research and development engineer at Kitware. And yes, I am joining everyone today from Colorado. Um, and so, yeah, thanks, Matt, for the introduction. And with that, I want to go ahead and just get started with this. Um, so today I'm going to be providing a guide to PyVista. Um, this is basically, you know, how to get up and running with PyVista, how to do really basic stuff such as load your data into PyVista data structures and start performing things um, like 3D visualization and different analysis techniques or filtering methods on your data sets. Um, and so with that, I, I think everyone who is tuning in live is probably has access or should have access to the um, T21 Tuesday PyVista Slack channel on the Software Underground. And in there, I just posted um, a link to a GitHub repository, and that's what I'm sharing here on my screen. And so uh, and so I'd, I think at this time, I think everyone should go to this GitHub repository and download the contents. So if you go to this repo at um, github.com slash Bain Sullivan slash transform dash 2021, um, you can hit code and then download a zip. And once you do that, it just downloads the entire contents of, um, um, of this repository, which holds everything that you're gonna need for um, this specific workshop. I also want to remind everyone that I, um, I might be going really fast through this. I might be talking really fast. I might jump, uh, jump through things really quickly. And so at any time, feel free to pause the live stream and then catch up um, with me. And I think um, just sort of as a heads up, I will be doing a, a sort of a pause or a break on the hour. So for um, so I think this is a two hour session. It started on the hour. And so um, on the next hour, I'll be doing a break and I'll be trying to look at the Slack channel um, in depth then to see if there's any unanswered questions at that time and try to address them there. Um, I'll also sort of periodically keep an eye on that channel just to make sure people aren't um, running into some serious issue um, and things like that. So, so definitely feel free to post any questions, thoughts, or, or anything going on in that um, PyVista channel on the Slack. Um, I believe there are a few other sort of people who are, are more familiar with PyVista that will be there to help address some questions. And, and as I go, I will try to address them as well. Um, but please just remember at any time, feel free to pause the live stream um, and, and explore something in depth a bit more and then catch up to me um, later in the session. And just remember that on the hour, I will be taking a break to address some questions, um, get some water, let everyone else do the same. And so with that, I think we're off. And, uh, and so yeah, so I hope at this time, everyone's found their way to this GitHub repository. They've downloaded the notebook or they downloaded this entire um, folder. And, um, and with that, we can get started. And I am assuming that most people, and from the poll that I sent out in the Slack channel, I think it seems, um, yep, 88% uh, of the people that responded at least are, are ready to go using Anaconda, which is perfect. And so I've set this um, workshop up um, for those people um, who are most familiar with Anaconda. And so with that, I am basically gonna run through the setup with you real quick, just to make sure um, everyone knows what they're doing, but the readme sort of provides basic instructions. Um, so in this uh, repo that you downloaded, there's an environment YAML file, and that's just a Conda environment specification file that you can use to create a Conda virtual environment. And so here, you know, step one, just download the repository. Step two, um, you'll navigate into that in a terminal and um, run this command right here. And so I'm gonna open a new, uh, new terminal command or a new terminal window, and I'm just going to share that on my screen and help uh, sort of just run through that with everyone. So um, I downloaded the repository to my desktop, um, and um, 
and I'm just gonna see into it and then move it over. Cool. All right, so on my screen right now, hopefully that text is large enough for everybody to see. Um, so I've seeded into this uh, repository um, and you can see all of those files that are on the GitHub repository. So you can see the environment YAML file um, and then two directories of basic notebooks and geo notebooks, which are some coding examples that I'm gonna run through with you all today. So to get started, let's go ahead and copy that command, conda environment create, um, you know, with that environment file, we can just copy that. That's gonna point again to this environment file we have right there. And once we do that, that should start setting up the, um, oh, I already created this environment. So, um, so it doesn't wanna create it again. So then I will just conda activate um, this environment. Um, and so hopefully everyone's running this create command, I'm having an opportunity to activate the environment. And so I already have it activated um, and I'm ready to go at this point. Um, and so that's what that third command there is, just to activate um, the environment. And so I guess while that's loading in the background, now I wanna point you all to a whole bunch of other resources and start to provide sort of an overview of PyVista and sort of a guide to getting started here, um, or just a general introduction to PyVista. And so on the repository, I have a few links. The first one is the live stream, which I think all of you are watching right now. And the second one is basic, just a guide to PyVista for geoscientists. And this link is on my personal website. Um, so if you go to bainsolvencom slash PyVista, um, you'll see this, uh, this guide and I have this open um, already in, um, in a separate tab here. And so I just wanna point everyone to this. And this is a guide that I'm currently working on um, and I've put a lot of effort into it prior to this workshop, just to provide sort of an overview of, um, of PyVista and how it's relevant to geoscientists. And I think this is something that a lot of you might find value in um, either during the workshop or after the workshop just to peruse and sort of get a feel for um, why um, I'm, you know, why I contributed to PyVista and why I think it's a highly relevant 3D visualization analysis library specifically for geoscientists. And so if you go in here, um, I think I want to start off and just sort of give sort of a brief introduction of, you know, 3D geoscience and um, sort of uh, general concept of data management and integration. And I think what's really important here, I think everyone should go through and maybe just uh, browse through this guide themselves. Um, but I think the general overview here is that available free and open source software to integrate your subsurface information um, and visualize things in like a cohesive 3D rendering space is really, really limited. And these limitations are from, you know, disconnects in commercial software and just a lack of open source um, tooling in the research community. And so there's not a lot of free and open source software to allow you to do really um, complex and powerful things like visualize um, all of your different 3D data in one cohesive and integrated environment um, for gaining insight into all of the different data types that you have. And so what I mean by that is, you know, taking your DEMs, your digital elevation models, uh, maybe your structural geology models, or maybe some other geostatistical model that you have that you created, um, different well locations or fault lines or fault services, and then integrating all of those into like one cohesive um, visualization so that way you can gain insight into, you know, how do um, things like your geostatistical model uh, inverted from, or, you know, some sort of geostatistical model created from different um, sort of well data, how does that relate to maybe a geological model that someone else created? Um, uh, and things like that. And um, and so there's all types of, you know, spatial 3D data that we have in, geo, in, in sort of geoscientific context. Um, a lot of that is um, things like site contextual information. So again, like digital elevation models with um, terrain maps or um, different geological maps that you might overlay those topographical sur topography surfaces or things like LIDAR point clouds where you have um, sort of just uh, lots of sparse points. Um, things like that, or you have sort of the 2.5 data sets, things like GPR images, seismic images, um, or even geological cross sections. Um, and then other things like sparse observational data where you might go out and take things like discrete measurements of, um, of any given um, physical property or physical field, um, such as like going out with a gravimeter and, and measuring gravity. Um, or you could have things like a structural geology model where it's actually like sort of a 3D model of a whole bunch of different surfaces outlining sort of the contacts and barriers between different lithological units in the subsurface. Or you can actually have like 3D inverted geophysical models 
um, where you have some large grid and you've actually inverted for some physical property in the subsurface. And so we, in, geo, in the geosciences, there's just a plethora of all of these different types of um, sort of 3D uh, data types. And we want to be able to handle all of those data types in a, um, in a 3D rendering package and, um, and be able to integrate them into sort of a cohesive environment and fuse them together. And so in this guide, I, I go through sort of the need for this and sort of making a case for um, why this is really relevant and sort of listing out a few different open source packages. And I don't really touch on commercial packages. There are a number of commercial packages that are available um, to do these sorts of tasks. Um, but um, I don't necessarily want to touch on those just because I, I don't feel necessarily qualified to provide a review on any of those. And also we're um, sort of um, here at a, a conference focused on open source software. So I think um, the focus here should be, you know, what sorts of tools are, are open and freely available for you to use to do these sorts of, uh, do this sort of work. Um, and so this is sort of the introduction on this guide. Um, and I think maybe the most relevant and sort of what this workshop's really going to be touching on is sort of this introduction to PyVista um, and treating or sort of using PyVista as a general 3D data management and visualization framework. Um, and so there's a whole suite of software built around PyVista. Um, a lot of other open tools that um, that uh, that you can use with PyVista to, to do all sorts of geoprocessing tasks. Um, and, um, and that's what this introducing PyVista section sort of touches on here in the intro. And you can also jump over to the JOS publication just to gain some more insight. Um, but I think the end goal here is we want to be able to produce visualizations like what we see here in, in figure three and just sort of be able to visually integrate all sorts of different geospatial data. Um, and where you can have, you know, your digital elevation model with an overlaying geological map different fault surfaces that you know of, um, or maybe some sort of isocontours of some sort of geostatistical model in the subsurface, different observational data that might be in the subsurface, or some sort of geospatial data like a um, just a site boundary or something like that. Um, and so you want to be able to create one cohesive 3D environment where all of these things can sort of be visualized together. You can gain insight and sort of be able to understand all of the different data in relation to um, your other data. And so I think what I really want to touch on today are the different data structures in PyVista, um, sort of what are the core data structures backing PyVista. And we're going to go through some coding examples on how to create each of these. And um, I at first just want to give a, a brief intro of which ones those are. And so if you scroll down here, again, we're, we're on this um, introducing PyVista section of the, the guide here and scroll down to data structures. And, um, and here I just list out the um, the five different core data types in PyVista. And so these five core types are polydata, rectilinear grids, uniform grids, structured grids, and unstructured grids. So as you can tell, there's a lot of grid data. Um, and I think these names typically come from sort of the backing ETK software behind PyVista. Um, but, uh, but I want to go in detail today and just sort of explain, you know, what you know, of all these core data types in PyVista, what sorts of geospatial data um, might be represented by these data types. And so polydata is typically your 1D or 2D ge geometries. And what I mean by 1D geometry, um, so 1D would be things just like points. Or, you know, if you want to create a mesh that is a, just a point cloud with no um, sort of connectivity or, or geometry on that, um, that would be a 1D uh, polydata object. And so, um, and so that we can sort of see that here. And so this figure four right here just sort of provides a few different um, representations of different polydata objects. So you can see point clouds fall into polydata. Things like elevation model um, can sometimes fall into polydata, or polydata objects where it's just a, basically a surface of 2D geometries. Um, or sparse observational data is another sort of 1D geometry that, that is encompassed by polydata. Um, things like line sets, where you like ge um, geospatial information, um, where you just have points and lines to create some sort of boundary or maybe um, sort, sort of trace, that would be represented by polydata. Or you could have full model surfaces. So here, this is sort of a maybe a bit difficult to see in this figure, but you can see there's actual like 3D volumes represented by a surface, and that's actually considered polydata. And so hopefully that sort of provides a, a brief um, background behind what polydata objects are. They're basically just different points or surfaces um, that we might represent as meshes. Um, the next type, which is really, really common in the earth sciences are rectilinear grids. 
And so this is typically an implicit geometry where you have um, sort of uh, different coordinates defined along each axial direction in sort of a rectangular fashion. Um, and uh, I just, and, um, and so actually, and so what we have here is um, sort of a, a comparison of these three different grid types. Um, the first one, a rectilinear grid. So as you can see on the sort of X, Y, and Z axes, we have sort of these discrete points um, where you can see uh, we have some, uh, you know, basically at, at 10 minus, or minus 10, minus five, um, whatever numbers these are between five and zero um, and so forth. And it repeats on both sides. And it doesn't necessarily have to, but the point is that basically in your mesh, um, you have all points have these x values, and then all z values have, or all z points have these z values, and same with y. And so there you can define sort of this implicit grid by just having a list of x coordinates, a list of y coordinates, and a list of z coordinates. And that's what uh, sort of defines a rectilinear grid. And this is a really common data type in different geospatial libraries. Um, and you'll see this all, all over the place. And it, it is commonly referred to in, as sort of some sort of rectilinear structure. Um, the next type was uh, a uniform grid. And this is, again, something that's sort of implicitly defined. And this is usually, um, actually, I guess we enforce in PyVista at least that a uniform grid have uniform cell sizes. Um, and uh, they're defined sort of in a uniform fashion along each axis. And, uh, and again, it's an implicitly defined um, data structure. And so in a uniform grid in PyVista, we define some sort of origin point. Um, and usually that, you know, in this example, I think it's zero, 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 and then we provide some cell size. So every cell will have a uniform size and then the grid implicitly builds out from your origin point. Um, and then the final data structure, which is probably the most fun, um, at least for grid types, uh, is the structure grid. And so a structure grid is any sort of lattice of points aligned with any internal coordinate axis. Um, and such that sort of the connectivity is built uh, built um, of that sort of internal coordinate structure. And so this allows you to create these sort of curvilinear um, grid structures um, and all of that. So any sort of grid that might have some sort of internal structure to it, where you have some sort of big list of points, and then you sort of know that every point is connected to another point to define different cells or volumes um, in, in sort of this internal fashion to create a lattice. So those are the three main grid types. Um, and, and I think, as you can imagine, there's a whole plethora of different geospatial data types that you can represent with these, um, with these different ones. And so you can imagine um, for a rectilinear grid, that's where you're going to be producing a lot of maybe your geophysical inverted models where you want to discretize the subsurface at some sort of, uh, some sort of resolution. A uniform grid um, can be used and often is used in both a 2D and 3D context. So in a, in a 2D context, you might only have a uniform grid defined on the XY plane with no Z variation. And for that case, um, that's very often um, sort of what you see with raster data sets. And, um, <clears throat> and, and same with structure grids. So a structure grid you could also use in a 2D fashion um, for defining things like digital elevation models um, and things like that. Um, and the last data type that uh, PyVista has is an unstructured grid. And this is sort of just a catch-all for everything else. Um, it's usually what is produced by PyVista filters and analysis methods and, uh, and very often, or, or not very often something that um, a user actually creates. Um, and so this is sort of the unstructured grid is just sort of a catch all for all of these sort of processed and um, irregular data structures that a user doesn't create themselves. And, and I guess I don't really have um, any sort of example of this, but um, we will see examples of this unstructured grid in some of the demos that I'm going to go through today. Um, and so, um, so that's basically just a, an overview of the PyVista data types. Um, and this guide goes on a bit more just to talk about um, how PyVista has different data structures for um, sort of capturing all of the all of your different project data together um, in something called a multi-block data set. Um, and, and PyVista provides some tools that um, can help you with sort of your project data management. Um, and I would recommend just looking at this guide on your own time. I'm not going to really jump through this just because I want to start getting to the examples here. Um, as uh, once I hit about the 30 minute mark um, and, uh, and go from there. Um, and so again, I just want to you know, highlight again, sort of some of the visual fusion properties of, of PyVista. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go back to the GitHub repository page and just remind you all, you know, 
go ahead and, and maybe pause the video, take a look at the guide for Py to PyVista on my website, or maybe just save that link for later and, uh, and go for there. I'm going to take a quick momentary break just to um, grab a Okay, I am back, and um, and now I'm going to start um, just sort of giving an introduction to how to use PyVista in the wild. So we're going to go on to this third link here um, that says, "What is a PyVista mesh?" If we open this in a new tab, um, this is straight from the PyVista docs. So this is at docs.pyvista.org, and it's just a basic overview of you know what is a mesh. Um, and so this sort of is a guide into what I just went over. Um, and I want to run through the code examples here. Um, yes, I did just see someone post a message of, on the Slack about the puppy, and that is exactly what's distracting me right now. Um, but uh, yeah, so I want to go through this example of basically what is a mesh um, and, and sort of what are the different things that we deal with in, in meshes. And so, um, and so I want to copy and paste this code and, and sort of just give a uh, sort of a um, quick run through of, of this guide here that's on the PyVista docs website. Um, and so if I go in here, I just create a new notebook. So this is just you know somewhere at the top level. Um, hopefully, I guess everyone should have created their Conda environment with that environment file and then run Jupyter Lab. Um, and, and hopefully they are ready to go with a Jupyter Lab instance um, pulled up or even Jupyter Notebook um, sort of server pulled up. Um, with the different geo notebooks, basic notebooks, folders ready to go. And here, I'm just going to create a blank notebook from scratch and run through this guide um, of what is a mesh. And so, um, so basically, in PyVista, um, a mesh is what we refer to as any spatially referenced information. And so, a mesh usually consists of geometrical representations of a surface um, um, or, or a volume in 3D space. Um, and uh, and yeah, and so the distinction between a mesh, a grid, and a volume can get really fuzzy. And I want to emphasize that that doesn't matter in PyVista because we worked really hard um, to make sure that that distinction doesn't matter and just be able to treat all your different data types in the exact same fashion through different spatial filters or plotting methods um, and just make it really, really accessible and easy for users to, to do things like filter their data sets and plot their data sets. And I, and I suppose at this point, um, a lot of you may be confused uh, um, maybe confused about what a what a filter might mean um, or or anything like that, and I'm going to jump into sort of um, a guide through the filters. Um, but first, I want to talk about you know a bit of what is a, sort of a mesh. And so in PyVista, um, I want to first start with what is a node. And so nodes are the vertices of a mesh, basically the x y z coordinates of the underlying structure. And all PyVista data sets, um, all meshes basically have to have nodes. And sometimes you can have meshes that are only nodes. Um, and so for example, let's create a point cloud. And so that's what this little example does. So it, it takes num NumPy um, and produces basically just a random set of points. And so here, here I'm going to start with just importing NumPy and PyVista. We can do that. Um, and here, let's start with just creating that random set of points. And, and so that's what we do here. And so just outputs a whole bunch of points basically with a um, 100 by 3 structure. So that way, the x column is sort of this first one, and then the second column is y, and then third column would be z. And basically, to create a point cloud in PyVista, once you have some sort of NumPy array, all you have to do is just pass those NumPy, uh, that NumPy array straight to the poly data object from PyVista. So you can see PyVista. This Py, we imported PyVista as PV, and we can hit PV.polyData and pass in nodes as the sort of constructing um, uh, points. And um, if we just output that real quick, we can see we have 100 points in the data set, which, again, matches with our um, um, uh, what we created there above. And then if we want to visualize um, these points, we can just, you know, we copy and pasted this code from earlier. We can just say, you know, we created this polydata mesh object. We can just hit polydata or, um, you know, this mesh dot plot and say point size equals 10. And maybe I want to, we'll just start with that. 
And you can see here, we now have a point cloud that's being visualized straight in the Jupyter Notebook. Um, and so it's just that easy. If you want to create a point cloud in PyVista and visualize it, that's all it takes. And maybe we want to do something fancy like uh, render points, uh, points as spheres. We can do that and just pass that in as an argument. And there you can see I have a whole bunch of different spheres in my um, plotting environment. Um, and so that's how quick and easy it is basically just produce um, sort of a nodal mesh of just points to create a point cloud. Um, cool. And so, um, and so it's really important to note, I mentioned earlier that all PyVista meshes have nodes, um, but most meshes basically have to have some sort of connectivity between all of these nodes to create sort of the gridded meshes that you see. And so in this next code example, I'm going to run through that where we're just going to load um, sort of an example data set and highlight what I mean by that. Um, and so here I'm going to scroll down and I'm going to copy and paste this code and I'm going to move this to another cell. But um, from here, I say, OK, from PyVista, let's import the examples module. Um, and here we have this hex beam data set. That's sort of an example uh, mesh that we have. You can ignore this camera position object that I create. This just helps make the docs a little prettier. Um, and I'm going to get rid of the screenshot command. And, uh, and basically, just I'm going to run through you know, uh, this plotting. I guess it gets a little bit complicated for where we are in this tutorial at the moment. But just know for the second that all we're doing is we're adding the original mesh. So you can see mesh is loaded from load hex beam. Um, we want to show the edges on it. It's going to be white. And then we're going to add another mesh, which is basically just a, a point cloud representation of all the points in that mesh. And those are going to be red. Um, and, you know, don't worry about what sort of what all is going on here yet. We're going to get into that later. Um, but here you can see, you know, in any sort of gridded data structure, you have sort of you have your points, your nodes, and your meshes, and then you have some sort of defined connectivity between all the nodes to produce sort of a gridded volume. And so that's what you can see here in this example. Cool. Um, and then, you know, again, here's just another example for redundancy where it's a triangulated mesh, um, and so we can create or we can load this uh, bunny mesh from from the examples module. Um, and do the exact same thing, where you're just adding the mesh, then adding the points and a red uh, representation. And then you can sort of see what's going on and sort of how all the different triangles of mesh are just defined by different um, sort of connectivity between all the nodes there. Um, and so I think now what I want to get to is sort of um, you know, what exactly are cells and how do we represent data on your cells? And so in sort of further on this page, um, sort of I go through and, and just provide a way to highlight, you know, a cell is basically just the region between nodes that you define. So in this hex beam example, we have a whole bunch of voxel cells. So um, you basically have eight nodes and then um, a whole bunch of uh, planes between those nodes to, to find some sort of enclosed voxel cell. And that's what we have here. But what's really awesome about PyVista is we can associate different attributes to, um, to the cells or nodes in your data set. And so attributes are data values that live on either your nodes or the cells of any given mesh. Um, and so in PyVista, we've worked really hard to make sort of that distinction or that difference um, still really easy to work with um, and, um, and basically just provide a way of, of putting arrays directly on your mesh um, through these uh, point arrays and cell arrays dictionary. But at the same time, so you can see here in this, in this code right here, I say mesh.point arrays and then index it like a dictionary and say, you know, my point values equals some NumPy array. Um, we can also get rid of this dot point arrays just and just um, sort of index the mesh itself by this array name, and it will place your array on the correct dictionary um, just implicitly by saying, okay, what's the length? Is it the same length as the number of nodes, or is it the same length as the number of cells in the mesh? And so here I want to um, just copy and paste this code now and sort of show you how we can take our hex beam example that we did, and we can add some sort of scalar data um, to all of the points on the mesh. And so um, what I do here is I say, OK, mesh.point arrays um, equals some NumPy A range. You know, Just create a random, basically a, a, just an arbitrary um, array of scalar data, the same length as the number of nodes. And then let's associate all of those um, to um, the nodes in the mesh. And so like I said, we can take away this dot point arrays and just index the mesh directly. And then this will implicitly figure out should these um, should that array go on the point arrays or the cell arrays. And then we can plot it. And I'm just going to take out the screenshot command and plot it real quick. And there you can see um, you can see sort of a, a little bit of a gradient where um, you know every 
a point in, or every sort of value in the scalar data array got associated with um, the different points in the mesh. And then across the cells, you can see sort of the values being interpolated. Um, and that's where you see these little bit of gradients. Um, and so we can do the same thing for cell arrays. And so in the next little bit of code, um, I do the same thing, create um, an A range with the same length as the number of cells. And we just want to add that onto the mesh and plot it uh, real quick. Um, and, um, and so that's where, and so now you can see there's no more gradient where we have sort of discrete values for every cell. And I think this might be um, probably one of the more common cases when we're talking about geo, geo scientific models um, or whenever we're representing different physical properties of the subsurface. And, uh, <clears throat> and so here you can see like every cell has some sort of discrete value. And so that's why you see no more gradient or interpolation between cells like we did with the point data. I think that's sort of an important distinction to make. Um, just sort of, okay, you know, how do we put data onto a mesh? Um, there's these two different routes. And I think a lot of people typically think, um, you know, of the second example with cell data, where every cell in the mesh has some sort of discrete value associated with it. And so it's just important to highlight that distinction. Um, okay. Cool. And so I think, um, you know, and in, on this page, I just, you know, further go on to explain that difference. And here you can see just another 3D example where um, you can see the sort of um, the scalar values being interpolated when you have point data and you can see them be very discrete when you have cell data. And OK, cool. So that's the basic rundown of all the PyVista data structures. We have these things called meshes, which represents you know, a mesh um, in PyVista. They all have the same API and the same way of accessing data and, and, um, and plotting and all of that. So everything can be treated the exact same at PyVista. And then we have scalar data that gets um, sort of attached to your different meshes and things like that. And so now I want to jump to this next page in the PyVista docs, which is this basic API usage page. I'm going to skip over the section on wrapping a VTK object and reading from a VTK file and just sort of talk about accessing um, a PyVista data object. And so um, again, here, I might just create another new notebook. And I'll just copy and paste this code. And I import PyVista, import the examples module, and I import NumPy. And then um, here, I might just copy and paste this code as well um, from there. And you can see I'm just going to go through each one of these at the same time. So I'm from the examples module, I'm just loading a random mesh or an arbitrary mesh. And this is an airplane mesh. Um, but I want to talk about how we can access different properties of, of any PyVista mesh with different attributes like this in cells, which tells you the number of cells in your mesh. Or we can see you know, the number of points in your mesh or the number of arrays with this in arrays um, attribute. And in this case, there are zero arrays, but maybe we can attach some um, arrays to it uh, in the future and, and update that. So, um, and then the next one is um, sort of like, what are the spatial bounds of your mesh? And so here you can see the X minimum value, the, the X maximum value, the Y minimum, and then the Y maximum and Z min, Z max. Um, and so that's what this mesh bounds is. It's a, a length six um, array of, of sort of the spatial extent of your mesh. Um, and then maybe we want to understand, or maybe we want to know where the center of the mesh lies. And so here you can see an XYZ coordinate of the center of the mesh. Um, and so this is like the basic API usage. And I guess here I want to just highlight, you know, if we added some sort of scalar data to this, so I can say, you know, mesh dot random and say equals mp dot random um, rand. And then we just say mesh dot in points that adds a random array of points to the mesh. And, um, and then if I hit this mesh dot in arrays now, now we can see we have one array and I added that. And so um, I got another cell here and just output it. And you can see here, I have this random array um, in the data arrays section of the representation of the mesh um, where it's a bunch of floats with some you know random minimax value. <laughs> Um, cool. So that's like the super basic way to access PyVista data objects and understand sort of, you know, some of the different properties associated with them. Um, something that I want to highlight as well is we can look at um, the mesh points. Um, and so if I say mesh dot points, that's all of the points in the data mesh or in the data object. So you can see a column for X, Y, and Z, um, a whole bunch of float values. And this is a, a PyVista underscore ND 
array, which is really just a wrapping of a NumPy array. So you can treat this as a NumPy array. And so you can say dot min, and it gives you the min, or you can say um, all the different, you can pass this to any NumPy function and, and it will just work because PyVista underscore ND array is just a wrapping of a NumPy array. Um, and so I want to, uh, you know, if I say mesh dot points, if I say is instance of a NumPy ND array, um, whoops. If I say is instance, we can see it's true. Um, so that's just reminding you that basically PyVista is built on NumPy arrays and it has basically an interface um, to NumPy. So, um, so the whole thing here is you should be passing all of your data um, to PyVista as NumPy arrays and, and, and PyVista pretty much will return everything as a NumPy array. Um, so this makes interoperability with, with sort of the entire Python data science stack um, quite, quite well. Uh, you know, and um, this API example basically just runs through a different, a few different ways of, you know, adding um, point arrays to, or like fetching your point arrays and adding new point arrays and all that things. And just sort of highlighting that, yes, everything is done over a NumPy interface and all that. Um, and again, every mesh has this sort of dot plot um, method to it where you can quickly visualize um, um, sort of your, your meshes and, and things like that. Um, and then this getting started guide also jumps into sort of a different syntax for plotting meshes. And so in PyVista, we have this dot plotter object. Um, and then once you instantiate a plotter, you can add many meshes to a scene um, and add other things like coordinate grids or different lighting techniques, all sorts of different things, and then um, sort of create a whole integrated scene. And that's sort of what this API is for. Um, and I think with that, I want to start jumping into some of the examples um, that I've pulled out for this repository. And this is where everyone else can start to get started and run these notebooks. So if you go into the basic notebooks folder, um, I've created or I've added a bunch of Jupyter notebooks here um, in a specific order. So I have this, um, these, this sort of um, 1.x category for basically different um, notebooks outlining how to create PyVista data structures. Then the second um, category for um, highlighting some different filters that we make available in PyVista. And then sort of the third one, we'll see if we get there. Those are just a few extra you know, um, plotting um, tutorials that I think might be relevant to a lot of geoscientists. And all of these notebooks in this basic dash notebooks folder um, come straight from the PyVista examples gallery. And so I, I sort of pulled these out just so, you know, I'm not pointing everyone to this examples gallery and overwhelming them because there are just a ton of examples in the PyVista examples gallery. Um, so if, you know, if you go to docs.pyvista.org slash examples, or if you just click on those examples gallery on the sidebar here, you'll see, you know, a whole bunch of different um, reproducible examples um, using PyVista, you know, in this first category to create different meshes, um, the second category for applying different filters or analysis to a mesh, um, all types of different things to like do things like cell extraction or volume extraction, contouring. There's just a ton of reproducible examples here. So I think post workshop, everyone should go on here and sort of explore the examples gallery um, and just sort of see what all PyVista has to offer. But again, I pulled out a lot of um, all of these notebooks that are included in the GitHub repository are pulled straight from this examples gallery in PyVista. And then after I run through these basic examples, um, then we'll get onto the geo notebooks. And these are um, examples that don't necessarily exist. Um, a few of them do in the PyVis examples gallery. And then a few of them are um, things from different support topics that have been posted over time or things I created myself. And these notebooks are actually all posted on the guide to PyVista. So again, that's on my personal website, what I introduced earlier. And if we go down to this examples here on the sidebar, you can see um, another examples gallery of just some geoscientific um, applications of PyVista. And that's actually where a lot of these geo notebooks come from. Um, and some of these actually have made their way into the PyVista examples gallery, but um, yeah. So I think for the next um, 20, 30 minutes, I'm gonna run into, run over the basic examples um, and just sort of help you all get started creating PyVista mesh objects um, and start getting our hands dirty. Um, and so just, uh, just a reminder, this all comes from the PyVista documentation website. Um, cool. So with that, I'm gonna close out of my previous two notebooks where I was running through the API and go ahead and get started with this 1.0 under the basic examples gallery. And I hope everyone else um, has this loaded up at this time. Um, and we're gonna run through creating a uniform grid um, in PyVista um, from some 3D NumPy arrays. And so I'm just gonna go ahead and run the first cell um, and run my imports, get everything imported. 
And um, in here, in this next code block, I'm going to create a NumPy array of different scalar values. Um, and so this is super, super simple. And I want to basically just highlight that we're going to create basically a 3D volume of cells um, and, and, um, and create a PyVista mesh from that. So if I run that little bit of it there, you can see I see values, lens space, 0 to 10. Uh, I have 1,000. Um, or sorry, that's my, my shape. Um, and uh, and then I just reshape it to this 2510 shape. And so you can see here values that shape. It's a 3D NumPy array with um, you know 20 values in the x direction, five values in the y direction, and 10 values in the z direction. And um, and I think a lot of people are really familiar with working with 3D NumPy arrays as sort of a maybe um, a, a really great format for your uniform grids or your models when you're doing different geological modeling or um, different geoscientific modeling. Um, and all that. And so I want to talk about how we can use um, this 3D NumPy array to create a PyVista uniform grid. Um, and so what we'll do first is we'll create a PyVista uniform grid. So we see pv.uniformgrid. Um, and now we have this grid object. And then we want to set the grid dimensions. And since um, I'm going to run through two different cases here where we want to put this 3D NumPy array either on the cells or the points, of the day of the mesh and I and, and from earlier I hope you remember I talked about the difference between points point data and cell data and I think in this first example um, I'm going to highlight the case of adding cell data so in that case um, basically we have to set the dimensions which are the number of points in the mesh as one plus um, the shape of our, our 3d array just because um, basically you'll have one more uh, one more um, sort of extent of points than the number of cells in your mesh and so that's what that's what's happening here when I say um, what's the shape plus one, and that's what I'm doing when I've set the dimensions of the grid. And then um, I set the origin of wherever I want it. Um, so this is the bottom left corner of the data set. And then I set the spacing. You know what are the voxel sizes along each axial direction? Um, so the x size will be one, the y size will be five, and the z size will be two. And so that's basically how we define um, how we define a uniform grid. So just that code there that's highlighted is how you actually create um, the uh, spatial reference of your uniform grid. And then um, once we do that, um, here I'm just going to take this code away and add a new cell for it. Um, I just want to output here that we do, you know, at this point we have a valid uniform grid and we can, and we can actually plot it. And so I can say grid.plot and um, you can see it here, and maybe I should do something to make it a little less boring and say show edges equals true. And you can see here, you know, here's my grid, and I have the basic geometry of it set up. But I think uh, what we're up to right now is actually adding in that 3D that 3D volume of data that we have. And so what we will do here is we say, okay, grid dot cell arrays our values is going to be the name of the array, and then we'll just take that 3D array from earlier. And we'll just flatten it in a F order. And F is uh, a bit sp specific to PyVista. And typically, if you're flattening an array, um, we need to do the order equals F um, in PyVista. And now if I do that, I can say grid.plot, and it will show all of these um, values on my 3D mesh. And that's what happens. Cool. And so you can see now I have my different, um, my every value from that 3D array associated with a cell in the PyVista uniform grid. And so hopefully you see the link here between a PyVista uniform grid and just a basic 3D NumPy array, where every cell in the PyVista uniform grid represents a different value in your 3D NumPy array. And I think this is a, a really common example that a lot of people want to create, just a 3D mesh or a 3D grid from a 3D NumPy array. And that's just a basic run through of how you do that and how, you know, if you have a 3D NumPy array, how you can go from that straight to a PyVista um, 3D array. And actually, there's a simpler way to do this, where let's say we say, you can say pv.wrap, and we can take that PyVista um, 3D, or, or you can take that NumPy 3D array of values and just say pyvista.wrap, and we can say, you know, just assign that to some variable, and we can output that, and it just automatically creates a uniform grid for us, because PyVista is, you know, a bit informed to say, okay, if I'm getting past a 3D array, I know that that's a, a uniform grid. And so then um, you can see there, I, I outputted it, and I can just add, whoops, well, I can plot it right here. And I can say temp.plot. We'll see the exact same. Whoops, sorry about that. Same thing. Um, except this, oop, let's just ignore that. Um, 
Anyway, so um, at this point, um, um, now I want to sort of highlight. You can do this a different way, um, where you're adding all of the array or all the values in your um, 3D NumPy array as point data. And so in this case, this is when you say dot dimensions equals value dot shape. So remember earlier I said value dot shape plus one, um, and in this case I say um, just values dot shape. And this um, basically when I add in my arrays and I put them on the point arrays, and uh, and we'll have the, pretty much the exact same thing, just you know, every point in this uniform grid now is where um, all of those values from the 3D NumPy array are associated. And so you can see here a bit of the interpolation. And I guess that gradient is hard to pick up on um, with this simple data set, but um, it does exist. So you can see in this example up here, um, the points or the values are a lot more discrete where every cell in the mesh has a discrete value. Um, and then here you can see a little bit of a gradient from how they're being interpolated across the cell. And so that's a basic run through of how to create a uniform grid or a 3D object from a 3D NumPy array. <clears throat> um, I see a question on the Slack channel right now about, um, is there a way to extract a 2D array from a 3D uniform grid planar slice? Um, this is uh, often a very common thing. I, I think someone's going to reply there and, and give a bit more context on how to do that, but we can very easily um, create slices of a uniform grid um, and, and all that. And I guess, yeah, I will, I'll jump into that later, but, um, but yeah. So first I want to finish up just creating different uh, mesh types using PyVista. And so the next example is just quickly creating a point cloud. Um, and so again, I'm just going to run through this example in 1.1, create point cloud, um, where we import all of our modules. And um, I just have a little helper here. You can kind of ignore the code here, but it just basically all you need to know is it outputs a NumPy array. You know, so here um, at this point, we just have a NumPy array of a whole bunch of X, Y, and Z coordinates. And to create a PyVista mesh of, of that, we just pass it to Polydata. We did this earlier. And so I can just pass those directly to the Polydata object creator. And um, <clears throat> And at this point, we have this polydata mesh with you know, all of the points in that data set that we did. Um, and here's just a, a little sanity check to say, OK, do the NumPy array of points that we originally have match the uh, polydata points that we have at this point? Um, and, um, and so just creating a point cloud mesh is just that simple. All you have to do is pass your um, 3D or, or your, um, sorry, your 2D array of, of, of um, XYZ coordinates to a polydata object. And then you have this mesh object in PyVista that we can do a whole bunch of cool things with. And I think uh, you know the first thing is you know just the dot plot method to visualize it in 3D. And um, and so here you can see I'm just plotting this point cloud with some item lighting, which is a special rendering technique, um, just to add some some better depth mapping to um, the point cloud when you're rendering it. And so I, I think you know for a lot of people, point clouds are really intuitive data structure and and something we see very often. So I just want to. You know, rehighlight. You know how easy it is to create a point cloud in PyVista by just passing your NumPy array, um, and uh, and so you know, there's um, um, basically if I want to now assign some sort of color values or scalar values to my point cloud, I can do that really easily by saying you know point cloud. Let's index it um, with the name elevation, and here I pull this data array as the points um, Z component. And so let's say, OK, for every point, I want to color it by the Z value. And so I can just add that data array. That's what I do there. Um, and then if I plot it again, um, I can render as, as, as spheres. And you can see now my point cloud is colored by the elevation value, which is pulled straight from the points. Um, yeah. And, uh, and so this is all, you know, um, this is all getting a bit into the weeds here, but um, we can also add in vectors to our points. And so um, here, if I just create some random points passing the poly data, and then I just compute some, some vectors along the mesh, um, I can have this other point cloud and just show a, a um, sort of a cool example of, whoops. Um, um, basically having a whole bunch of points and different vectors um, uh, coming from every point in your uh, in your point cloud. And so maybe this is really relevant for um, geoscientists working with um, different vector fields, whether that's from 
magnetic data or gravity data where you have sort of a, a full um, field of um, different vectors and for every point in your data set. And so um, I just want to highlight, you know, we can create these sorts of glyphs or these sorts of um, arrows um, uh, representing vector fields in PyVista. And so this is a really sort of a boring example of, you know, a random point cloud and then just create vectors outputting from the origin of that point cloud. Um, so, but it's just sort of to highlight the case of, you know, if we want to create these vectors, we have this filter called dot glyph, um, where we can orient um, a whole bunch of arrows um, from some sort of vector field that we have created. Um, okay, and so now for the next example, um, <clears throat> I'm gonna jump through how to create a triangulated surface. Um, and, and hopefully, um, and I think after this, I will um, take a quick break and then we'll jump into using filters. So, um, so in this example, um, again, we're just doing the, the basic imports, importing PyVista and NumPy. Um, and here, uh, we're just gonna create some, um, some points uh, that you might wanna triangulate. And so that's what this code block does. You don't really need to look into the weed of it, but or look into detail here. But um, basically, I just create an X array, a Y array, add some random perturbation to it, um, just so it's not like totally uniform. Um, and then um, basically just create a whole bunch of um, Z values as a simple Gaussian surface um, from those X coordinates. And at this point, you can see I have um, sort of this point cloud. And so um, again, we're just doing the standard thing of passing all those points to a polydata object. And now at this point, we have this point cloud of a Gaussian surface with a little bit of random perturbation along the X and Y uh, coordinates in a mesh represented as this, dot, as this cloud object. And here it is plotted. But let's say we know that like this point cloud is supposed to represent a surface. And so in PyVista, we have methods for now like triangulating a surface of all of these points. And, and to do that, all we have to do is this dot Delaunay 2D filter. Um, which will basically do a 2D Delaunay triangulation on the cloud of points. And so again, earlier here, I, I say cloud equals polydata of the, the points that were created of the Gaussian surface, you know, cloud.plot shows it. And now if I say cloud.delaunay2d and save that as a, this surf variable, um, that will um, triangulate the point cloud into a, a surface mesh. And then I can hit surface.plot to show that mesh. And that's what we have here. And so that triangulation was really, really quick. And we can see now we have a triangulated surface um, of that Gaussian point cloud that I had earlier. And so this can be done for, for any sort of point cloud that you have where um, you have sort of a 2D surface. And so maybe someone gave you a digital elevation model um, <coughs> uh, that was just given in a point cloud um, and you want to create an actual surface of that elevation model or those, um, those points that you have, um, you can easily just create a PyVista polydata object and hit this dot Delaunay 2D filter to create um, your actual surface there. Um, and so this is just a, a quick and easy way to create um, a surface from, from points. Um, and then the rest of this example, you know, this comes from the PyVista's docs. And so this goes through a few extra tips on how you can do some fancy things with the Delaunay 2D filter. And I'm not gonna run through these just because I don't think they're highly relevant for this workshop, um, but feel free to you know, pause the video and take a look and, and read through this um, and, and go from there. But um, basically it's just a way of you know, hiding cells and, and doing some fancier stuff with, um, with your um, triangulation. Um, and then the next example is how to create a structured grid or a structured surface. Um, and so this is again, you know, a structured grid or a structured surface is again, a very, very common format we see in the geosciences um, and a lot of disciplines. Um, and so I want to highlight how to create a PyVista structured grid um, from NumPy arrays. So in this example, I create um, some arrays uh, of my structured grid and, and I say, um, you know, I have some X coordinates and some Y coordinates on um, sort of at these values, and I just use the NumPy mesh grid function. Um, I think if you're familiar with um, using NumPy in um, a lot of geoscientific or, or computing environments, you're probably very familiar with this mesh grid format for representing different structured surfaces or structured grids. Um, and so that's what we're basically doing here. And this is, there's a pretty good mapping between um, a PyVista structured grid and a NumPy mesh grid. Um, and then, um, so I, I create this XY mesh grid, and then I um, I want to basically just uh, get some um, uh, Z values um, on that mesh grid just to create sort of a wavy surface. And that's what we do here. So at this point now we have sort of a, an XY NumPy mesh grid, and we can pass all of these values straight to 
the PyVista structure grid. So you can see X and Y are captured as the outputs of the NumPy mesh grid function. Um, and just uh, just to give you a remember or a reminder, you know you have this big X array, which is you know a um, a two D array of all of your X coordinates along your your mesh grid, and, and same with Y, um, you know where they match the dimensions. And then we have um, the Z um, component that I computed off of those. Um, and so we can just pass all of those values directly to this PyVista structure grid object, and we can plot it. So you can say structure grid, pass X, Y, Z, and then hit plot. And just from that, it knows how to build up your surface. And there you have this, this wavy surface. So again, you know, the X and Y values are in those directions and they're pretty uniform. Um, and then the Z value was just computed off of those as this um, square root of the sine function. And, uh, and you get this nice wavy surface now. Um, and then, you know, in this example, again, it goes on. This is, again, from the PyVista docs. And so there's a few extra um, things here just to um, do some fancier stuff. And I, I, I don't think I'm going to jump into this just because I want to make sure we have time to talk about the filters in a bit more detail um, and show off some of the really cool features of PyVista and then get to some of the geoscientific examples. Um, I think at this point, I am quite thirsty and we're about at the hour. So I'm going to take a quick break. And if you have any questions at this point, please post them in the Slack channel and I will try to address them, but I'm gonna just step away for a couple of minutes and grab uh, some water. Okay, we're still at the hour here, so I'm still gonna sort of consider this break time, but I am just gonna address one of the questions that I saw on the, um, on the Slack channel for this, um, on the question of slicing. So I'm just gonna create a new sample notebook here and I'm just gonna import PyVista as uh, PV. I'm gonna say from PyVista import examples. Um, and I'm just gonna load a mesh real quick from our examples module. Um, so let's say mesh, uh, let's load the um, channels example. So this is like a, a, a it's actually a geoscientific mesh of some different channels in the subsurface. So you can see here, this is a uniform grid. Um, and, and I think the question was, you know, when we create or extract a 2D, can we extract like a 2D array from a 3D uniform grid um, via slicing? And, um, and so we can, you know, in PyVista, there's these different filters. And I'm going to touch quite a bit on slicing a bit later in this 2.3 dash slicing example. But I just want to go ahead and touch on it um, since people are, are apparently interested. Um, so if I say, you know, mesh.slice, this is the slice filter, and it takes a whole bunch of different arguments to talk about the different normal and origin point of your slice. Um, and basically, all this does is it extracts a slice of, of the mesh. Um, and so when I do that, you can see the output of this is a polydata object, which is another PyVista mesh. And so I can hit SLC, whoop, SL, SLC.plot, and um, there we have um, sort of a slice of our original 2D mesh. And so if I say, you know, here, maybe I want to create a bit of a more integrated scene um, showing uh, sort of the original mesh and the uh, slice that I just created. Um, I can say p add mesh, and maybe let's put in the original mesh. Um, and let's say, you know, let's just give it a color, set that to true, and let PyVista decide, decide the default value um, and give it some opacity. Um, of, you know, something to make it a little bit transparent. Uh, it's 2.5. Um, and then I can say p.add mesh, and let's add that, whoop, add that SLC object, um, and then hit uh, p.show. And so this is just creating a little PyVista scene. Um, I add the mesh with some opacity so we can see inside of it um, in the solid color. And then I add the slice I just created. And we can see, you know, I, I took a slice from the center of the data object. And that's what we're seeing here. And so this slice function can take a whole ton of arguments to reorient that slice or do all kinds of things. There's also functionality in PyVista to be a bit more interactive with that. So um, there's a way where I can, here, I'll just copy and paste the same code. And instead of doing that, I can say PyVista, um, oh boy, I hope this is the right syntax. It's been a while since I've done this add mesh slice. Um, so I can use this add mesh slice helper method um, to basically um, create this plane on which I want to slice the mesh interactively. And um, hopefully the interactivity of this is 
is coming across um, over the live stream. Um, I guess here I should take away that solid coloring so you can see it is, you know, indeed a um, a slice from the original mesh. And so we can move this around interactively, change the normal of it, um, do all kinds of stuff to, to get it. Cool. And so I guess we're still on the break, so I'm going to, uh, oop, there's another question popped up here on the Slack. Um, hopefully what I'm showing here with interactivity, I guess hopefully that um, kind of answers your question. But yeah, if you want to use an iPy widget, um, you can do that. So you can, this is a bit too complicated for me to code on the fly, but I would love it if you opened up a support issue on this. Um, but basically you can um, create a, a custom class um, that will basically manage that slicing function and have the iPy widget um, basically call a callback that updates the slider location. And it's, it's not terribly complicated, but it, it will take me a couple of minutes to code up here um, on the fly. Um, and so um, there's different ways. We have slider widgets that will embed themselves in the rendering window um, where you can do this. And that's what Alex just mentioned on the, on the, live, on the chat channel. Um, but, uh, but you can also do that with an iPy widget example. And, and I imagine there might be a support topic on this. If there isn't, please go ahead and, and create one. Um, and just in case you're looking for that link, if you go to the original repository that I shared, um, there's this PyVista support form link there at the bottom of the link list. And um, in here, you can create your support issue to ask about this. And, and the PyVista community can follow up on how to actually create sort of a callback to, to update your, um, your slice uh, on the fly using IPy widgets. Cool, so I'm gonna give it another four to five minutes um, to continue this break, let anyone else who wants to step away from the computer um, have the opportunity to do so, and uh, for myself to continue to hydrate. Okay, I think I'm gonna wrap up the break here and start continuing with um, the rest of the examples and I'm gonna fly through a lot of these. So again, please um, feel free to pause the uh, live stream at any time and read some of the additional texts that are in the Jupyter Notebooks um, and, and go from there. Um, but I wanna just make sure over the next um, <clears throat> sort of 30 to 45 minutes, I guess for the next 30 minutes, I wanna fly through a lot of these examples um, and leave some time at the end for um, further questions and, and sort of interactive responses. Um, so I'm gonna fly through these, please, you know, uh, pause at any time if I'm going too fast for you and, and sort of read this and have, an, have a chance to sort of, you know, hit shift, shift tab on, on the different methods um, in the notebooks and, uh, <coughs> um, and sort of explore the documentation for, for everything that we're doing here. You know, you can hit shift tab um, on, a, on a function signature and, and see the sort of documentation. So, so definitely please, um, <laughs> hopefully don't get too overwhelmed if I'm, I'm going too fast. And then at the 45 minute mark, um, so it's my time right now, it's 12, 12, um, but on the 45 minute mark, I will be sort of ending the examples and just opening up to questions and trying to respond as interactively as I can um, from the Slack channel. And so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and um, get started on using different common filters in PyVista. <coughs> cool, so, um, so in this example, I'm on the, I'm still in the basic notebooks directory on this 2.0 um, using filters notebook. And in here, I'm just gonna run through a bunch of different really common filters that we see in PyVista that we use all the time. And I am having a mild disruption at the moment, so I got to
apologies for that disruption. All right, back to the example um, of using common filters. So in this example, I'm gonna load just this simple load uniform data set and set the active scalers as a spatial point data on there. And I'm gonna show you some different filters that can be applied as these methods that are bound to every PyVista mesh data object. So in here, I first, I just create this um, uniform data object. Um, and so if I now output this, um, we can see I have this uniform grid here. And then I can, if let's say I want to threshold out or extract basically a region of interest um, given some criteria on sort of the scalar data values in the mesh. And so in this example, there's two um, spatial, I mean, sorry, there's two different um, sort of value arrays on the mesh, um, one for point data and one for cell data. And let's say I want to extract like a volume of interest or region of interest from that data set that matches some criteria. So in this case, I'm gonna do a threshold, um, which is what this dot threshold method is. And it, it accepts basically your values, um, what scalar arrays and a few different options. So you can read the documentation for this and see um, what exactly this threshold filter can accept. Um, but in this example right here, I want to say I want to extract a region of interest where my um, spatial point data array on the mesh, um, all the values are either between 100 and 500. And so you can see the extent of this array, the min max values are um, 0 to the 729. Um, and so I want to extract, you know, everywhere where it's 100 to 500. And, and then this other filter here is just um, dataset.outline creates um, sort of another poly data object of the outline of that that data object. And that's what I do right there in that code block. And then I'm going to plot this up real quick. And we can see here, rut row, um, that's really not good. My kernel just died. Um, I'm going to restart and go from the top. Um, Sorry about that. All right, so I just had a, a random fluke kernel issue, but here you can see the output of that threshold um, filter. And so that's what this thresh mess is. And the outline is that um, sort of boxy little um, set of lines there. And so you can see here, I took my original uniform grid, which if I go back up here and I can just hit, um, you know, data set dot plot, if I wanna just quickly look at what that is, it was this uniform grid, which is basically just a big old cube of data um, with some sort of, uh, you know, arbitrary uh, data values on it that just extend sort of along the 3D extent of the mesh. Um, and so here you can see I extracted everywhere where the spatial um, point data um, basically was um, from 100 to um, 500. And that's what this filter did. And so now you can see I extracted this different volume of interest um, within, my, um, within my uniform grid. And so that is an example of a thresholding filter for extracting a different volume of interest. Um, I also wanna talk about uh, just a few other of the, the common filters in PyVista. And so there's this contour filter um, to basically just produce um, either 1D or 2D surfaces um, uh, throughout a mesh, um, basically different contour intervals of your um, scalar data field. Or we can use, um, earlier I mentioned the slice filter, which I showed off um, sort of during the um, break there when someone had a question, and I'll talk a bit about more about slicing in a second, but I wanna show this slice underscore orthogonal um, method, and you can look at the documentation on this um, just to see it takes a whole bunch of different X, Y, and Z um, arguments if you wanna position the orthogonal slices a certain way, and then I wanna look at this uh, or show this glyph filter as well just to um, basically create different spheres um, sort of glyph throughout the volume. Um, and so that's what these three filter methods do. And then in this next code block, I'm just adding them all to a um, multi-plotter scene. And so here I, I instantiate the scene PV plotter and I give it a shape of two, two. Um, so that means it's gonna be a two by two grid of different scenes. And then um, hopefully this is well commented enough, but I basically just go through and I add the threshold filter that we did earlier. I add the contours that I just created right here with this contour filter. Um, and then I add the slices from the slice orthogonal filter. And then I add the glyph and we can link all these views with that method and I can just execute this cell and we can see here, here's the output of this uniform grid um, with a few different filters applied. And so you can see like um, in the case of the threshold, it looks the exact same as earlier where we extracted a volume interest. The contours, um, the contour filter looks at your array on, you know, your scalar data array on the mesh 
and then produces um, different 2D surface contours um, throughout the volume um, along different contour intervals of, of your scalar data array. The slice orthogonal method basically will create three orthogonal slices um, of your mesh, um, which is what's happening right here. And, uh, and you can position all of those um, yourself with uh, different parameters to the slice and or orthogonal method. And then this glyph filter looks at, um, basically it created a point um, for every point in the mesh, it created a sphere, and then it changed the, the sort of size of that sphere based on um, the uh, values of the scalar data array in your mesh. And so these are just four different, really common filters we see people use in PyVista, where they want to sort of look inside the volume of data they have. And so this glyphing method is often really insightful for me when I have um, sort of a lot of data inside a volume, and I just want to see, you know, I want to say, okay, make really big spheres where the data values are blowing up, and I can see that. Or, you know, when the data values are small and, you know, maybe insignificant in my example, um, then let's make those spheres really, really small. And that's exactly what this glyph filter is doing. Um, same with contouring, that can be really, really useful um, for gaining insight into different sort of ISO value regions throughout a 3D model and all that. And I think everyone in, in, in Earth science is probably familiar with orthogonal slices, but you're probably most familiar with seeing those in a 2D context where you, where you display each of these orthogonal slices on their own 2D image um, uh, next to each other. Um, another thing I want to talk about is how in PyVista we can chain different filters together. Um, and basically, so every output of a PyVista filter is a PyVista mesh object. And so in this case, I can um, create a filtering chain, um, basically to um, at, like sort of get the result, um, sort of a, sort of the sum of results of all these different filters. And so in this case, I'm gonna do a threshold filter. When I don't pass any arguments like that, that actually, it just removes all of the NAN or empty values from the mesh. Um, and then I'm gonna apply a dot elevation filter. And the elevation filter just says, um, there's a few extra arguments you can provide to it to change what it does, but um, by default, it will add a new array to your mesh called elevation with a capital E here. Um, and it will basically just put the Z values of every point in the mesh um, as that data array. And then um, I'm gonna chain together this clip filter and I wanna clip it um, basically at the center. If I don't provide an origin in the clip filter and I just say normal Z, it will do a Z plane at the center of the data set. And then I wanna slice that orthogonally. And so this is just a quick way to basically chain together a few different filters in PyVista to, to come up with some result. And so if I run this, we can see, you know, here's my original, uh, the outline of the original data set that I had. And you can see here, I clipped it at Z. And so that's where you can see sort of why there's no data up here in this region and only data down below. Um, and then you can see the output of the slice orthogonal filter. And then you can see um, the elevation filter gave us these elevation values. And so that's just a quick and easy way to chain together different PyVista filters. And so that's a basic introduction to filters with PyVista. Um, now I wanna talk a bit about um, some of those filters in detail. So clipping is a really common one where we want to clip um, our meshes in, with different um, sort of planes or boxes to extract different regions of interest. And so in this example, I'm just gonna go ahead and run through and we're gonna, you know, this isn't very, a, you know, specifically a geoscientific data example because we're gonna be loading this bunny mesh. Um, but I want to talk about how, you know, basically it doesn't matter what your data are, um, we can apply these filters in all the same way. Um, and so in this example, I'm loading a bunny mesh and I'm going to run this clip filter along the Y axis. And, um, and it's just going to do that in the center. And if I go ahead and plot that, which is what this code does, we can see, you know, I, I added in here um, my clipped mesh, which is this tan mesh. And then I added in um, the original data set with a wireframe structure, which you can see the original data set here in this blue wireframe um, all throughout. Um, but you can see I, I applied this clip filter with Y. And so basically the clip filter just takes um, some plane through the data and then just chops off all of the data behind the plane. Um, and so that's one way to extract a region of interest. If you wanna just, um, you know, whether it's in the X, Y, Z or some sort of manual um, direction, you can sort of extract a region um, of, uh, uh, of a given mesh. Um, and another really, um, uh, uh, another common way of clipping a data set is with this clip box filter. And so maybe you have some X, Y, and Z bounds. So here 
I'm going to load a different mesh, this office data set, which is just like, a, I think it's a structured grid or something. Um, but again, with PyVista, it doesn't really matter what your data type is. All the filters work the same. Um, and so I can hit, OK, so maybe I have some x bounds from 2 to 4.5, um, same on the y, and then from z, 1 to 3. And so maybe I, um, I, I just want to clip along those x bounds. So I can pass these bounds to this clip box filter and on this data set object and get back this clipped mesh and add this to the plotter and plot it. And we can see here, like I, I extracted, you know, maybe I wanted in this case with the clip box, I actually chopped out the region um, that I sp specified, but I can hit, you know, um, this invert flag. And so it's default by, or sorry, it's true by default. Um, but if I hit invert equals false, we'll get the opposite case, um, right? Cool. And so there you can see we have now the region of interest extracted by this, just this length six list of your X uh, min max values, your Y min max values, and your Z min max values. And so that's like a quickly, quick, easy way to just extract a, a box region of interest from a mesh with this clip box filter. Um, and then um, there's other more fancy ways of going about this where you can use um, some sort of, uh, you know, rotated box. And so in this, this is a bit of a more complicated example, but I'll go ahead and show it. So maybe we have some sort of mesh and we have some sort of rotated box um, like that. Um, then we can actually use this, um, that, that region of interest, which is just um, here I created as a PyVista cube object, which is just a polydata mesh. Um, and I rotated it 33 degrees along the axis. Um, and uh, and I can use that. I can just pass that directly to Clipbox and and extract um, extract that region of interest. So you can see the original sort of representation where I have the mesh and I have some some red box, um, and then I can actually just extract it like that. And you can see um, in this view on the right here, um, we only get you know the region of the mess inside that box with that Clipbox filter. And so that's another really common way to to sort of extract. Um, um, some sort of region of interest given some polydata object. Um, and I guess um, we typically expect this polydata object to be a box um, with planes um, rather than any arbitrary shape. But there are other filters in PyVista to, to handle some sort of arbitrary volume or region of interest. Um, I think earlier in this example, I'm just looking at the Slack channel while I go through. Um, in this clip with plane example, someone was asking, where is the clip level defined along Y? And uh, hopefully, so if I hit um, this shift tab on this, we can see the function, function signature for um, the clip filter. And the level is defined by the origin. Um, and so if I leave this as um, empty, it, usually, it takes the center of the data set by default. So that's why you can see here, um, right at the center of the Y extent, um, or sorry, yeah, center of the Y extent on this mesh, we um, we chop the data set. And so if I, um, I can pass in some value, um, and if I hit, you know, data set dot center, that's the, the default value. And so maybe I want to just copy that real quick. And I can say, you know, origin of the slice will be this value. Um, Maybe here, maybe I'll just do uh, change that Y value. And so I could just change that Y value real quick. And there's a little bit lower. Maybe I can hit, you know, um, minus uh, 0.5. I'm not really too sure. Yeah, so right there, you can see I can just move it by adjusting that Y value of the origin point. Um, yeah, and this origin has to be a um, sort of an, a, a length 3XYZ va value just because not always are the planes that you're using sort of the normal of the clip filter. They're not always a, you know, perfectly along aligned with the X, Y, and Z axes. So you could also do, you know, minus one, minus one, minus, minus two, or minus, yeah. Um, and pass in a custom normal. And there you can see I get like, um, you know, uh, some sort of arbitrary plane put at that uh, point. So maybe I'll take out the origin. And uh, you know you can you can create some sort of diagonal plane to cut along with, and so that's why you need like a full origin point of um, three x y z values. Cool. Um, and now I want to jump into contouring in a bit more detail. So I 
I did this, um, I, I ran through this um, real quick in the initial using filters um, example. And so in this example, I'm just gonna load in um, this random hills mesh, which is a 2D surface mesh. And I'm gonna hit the contour filter on that mesh and add it to a plotter scene. And so here you can see, I, I add the original mesh with uh, some transparency. Um, and then I add in the contours with a white coloring and line width. And since this is a 2D um, mesh, this original uh, load hills data set, um, so if I do that, I can hit mesh and you can see it's some poly data object and uh, I can hit this contour filter and just as a reminder, like all contour, like all filters in PyVista output some uh, PyVista data type. Um, so there you can see when I hit contour, it outputs some poly data mesh. So we can add all both of those to the scene now. And so uh, once I do that, we can see my original hills mesh with a whole bunch of white lines for the different contour levels of the elevation scalar field. Um, so that's a quick way to just create different uh, contours on something like a digital elevation map or something like that. Um, and then the other example is like maybe in, you know, in this first example, we started with a 2D surface mesh and we, then we created the next dimension down of contour levels. Um, but if you start with a 3D like volume of some sort of data or 3D mesh, then when you hit the contour filter, it's gonna create um, sort of the next dimension down of contour levels. So that means every contour would be a 2D surface instead of a 1D line, like in the above example. So in this case, I'm just gonna download a, uh, or example, like load a, a simple mesh or a 3D volume mesh from our examples module. And I'm gonna hit the contour filter. And in this example, I actually, so you can see here, I you can pass in custom ISO surfaces. Um, so like what values you want to run the contour filter on. And so here I have five contours um, between 50 and 200 on a scalar data field of this mesh. And then I can add these, uh, you know, run the filter, add them both to the scene. You can see here, like this is a lot more of a complicated example where it's not just some like sample, like really silly data, um, but actually like has really good variation inside the model. And so you can see a lot of the sort of nuance to the um, scalar field. And this allows you to sort of have a pseudo volume rendering of any given mesh. Um, whereas like if I just plotted this mesh by itself, it's really hard to get that sort of, whoops, um, get that sort of context. So if I hit mesh.plot, um, you can see it's just like some big volume of data, um, but you don't really know what's inside of there. And so a contour filter, um, it can often be like the best way to gain insight to what sort of variation you're seeing inside of your mesh. Um, and so that's an example of, of creating a whole bunch of different 2D surfaces um, of your uh, different contour levels um, throughout a mesh. Um, and now I'm gonna do another more advanced example on slicing um, in this 2.3 slicing notebook. So again, you know, running through the basic imports here, the only new thing is matplotlib. Um, but here I'm gonna load this channels data set, which I, I think I went over earlier. Um, I just defined some sample color map in, in matplotlib that I wanna use. Um, just an FYI in PyVista, we can um, pass any uh, matplotlib color maps to use um, as the color map um, for when you're doing 3D plotting. So in this example here, um, I just created a little um, uh, um, a varietas color map discretize at four values and um, plotted the, the channels mesh. And so you can see this is some big volume with a whole bunch of different um, channels or lithological units defined throughout it. It's kind of hard to see what's going on in there. Um, so we're gonna do some slicing to understand what's going on inside this mesh. Um, so the first thing I'm gonna run through is a slice orthogonal filter, which I touched on earlier in the introduction to filters notebook. Um, and so real quick, if I don't pass any arguments to that, it takes the center point of the mesh and then produces um, the orthogonal slices of the mesh along that, that origin point along each axial direction. And that's what we have here. Um, but if you look at the docs, you can play with this a little bit. So if I hit shift tab on this slicing filter, I can pass in different X, Y, and Z values to slice my mesh um, at different uh, locations. Um, and so that's, and that's what I do here. Um, so I can say, okay, maybe I wanna slice at X20, Y20, and Z30 and plot that. And we can see now we have um, some slices there closer to the edges of the mesh and then um, a Z value sort of at the bottom. And so that's like a way you can sort of move slices through the mesh and, and gain insight to what's going on there and, and save different uh, screenshots or, or pictures of the mesh at different slicing intervals. Um, another 
um, I guess the, the basic slice filter is this just dot slice method where you can pass in your normal and origin point. Um, again, in this example, I'm just passing the normal, which is some custom uh, vector direction. Um, I'm leaving the origin point um, uh, blank, so it defaults to the center of the mesh um, and, uh, and all that. And so here, if I just run this, this slice, we can see now I can slice that same mesh um, along some sort of arbitrary direction. Um, and we can uh, look at that. So that's um, another way to use a slice filter. Um, another little helper method that we have in PyVista attached to every mesh object is the slice along axis method. And so this takes, you know, what axial direction do you want? So this has to be like X, Y, or Z. Um, and, then it has, and then it takes like a number. So in this case, I'm gonna do seven slices along the Y direction. Um, and you could switch, switch this to X uh, or Z, and it will basically just produce seven different slices along that, that direction. <clears throat> and so that's what I've done here. So I took the, the original mesh object and I produced seven slices along, um, along my um, um, axial direction of Y for that mesh. And here, I'm just gonna change the lighting to false just so it's a little brighter. And so if I do that, um, we can see in here a bit better. Um, and so you can see there's seven different slices along the Y direction of my mesh. Um, there's another um, cool sort of way of slicing data sets where maybe you have a line through your data set. Um, so again, I'm still using this channels data set um, and I'm gonna create some path. And so maybe this is predefined by you. Um, in this example, I've created um, just some path, and and then I create a PyVista spline object of it, which is a polydata mesh. Um, so as you can see, I create this polydata line through there, and here I'm just going to plot. Um, um, I'm just going to plot the spline and like an outline of the um, of the mesh, just so you can see what I mean by saying there is um, basically just a line going through the model. Um, at, at some sort of arbitrary path. Um, and so that's what I have here. I just have some line going through my model and I want to create a slice along um, that spline. And so that's what this slice along line filter does. And so if I run model.slice along line past that spline, um, that filter will run. It might take a second to run um, just because this is a more computationally expensive method of slicing a model. But once we have that, it will produce a, um, <clears throat> a slice along that um, path through your model. And so it allows you to sort of create one big slice um, in that direction. And, and it could be along any arbitrary path. So this could be very curvy or it could be very straight, however you wanna define it. Um, another sort of example that made it uh, of, of doing um, 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 some slicing is just slicing in different vector directions. So in this example, <clears throat> um, I just take a vector um, and then I, uh, you know, I define some vector, which is just some line and produce many slices along that vector throughout this mesh. And that's what this example is doing. Um, and then, um, so again, I, I'm gonna be blowing through these just to make sure we get um, a bit through the, the tutorial. Um, and then there's another um, example down here of just slicing your mesh at different bearings throughout. So basically just running a for loop um, and, and producing different um, slices at different bearings throughout your mesh. Um, cool, so I think I'm gonna touch on like one more of these um, um, basic examples and I'm gonna jump to the geo notebook examples um, and then I'll open it up to discussion after that. So um, in this last basic notebook example, I want to talk a bit about interpolating. Um, and so this is often something that a lot of people want to do with their data. So maybe they have some sparse observational data and they have some surface and they want to um, basically interpolate the values of their sparse observational data onto the surface of their mesh. Um, in PyVista, we have an interpolate filter to do this. Um, and so it's just, you know, take your surface mesh. Um, so earlier here, I, I said surface equals that. Um, and then I can say service.interpolate. I can pass the original points with the data, set some radius. There's other parameters to refine how the interpolation is actually being performed. And you can look at that um, sort of, you can pause the video here and look at that. Um, but then, you know, if I run this interpolate filter and, and just plot that result, you can see here, um, we can see just a basic interpolation um, of all of the point, often like the sparse point data onto the surface mesh. And so it's like a really quick and dirty way to just to 
just interpolate um, your uh, point data onto a mesh. Um, and there's other more complex ways of doing this in PyVista. Um, and so here is a actual um, geostatistical example um, where I, um, I guess later there's another notebook in this repository that does this with a geostatistical uh, library called GSTools. But in PyVista, we can get an actually um, fairly decent result with just the basic and turbulate filter using a Gaussian kernel. Um, and so here we have this, um, this field of sparse observational data, which is just temperature in the subsurface taken from temperature probes. And I want to interpolate that to come up with a 3D model of like the temperature field in the subsurface. And so we can use PyVista's interpolate filter, pass that probe data onto this grid object, which I created um, manually um, around sort of the extent of all the points. And so we can say grid.interpolate points. So it's going to interpolate all the values of the probes onto the grid. Um, I set the radius sharpness and uh, strategy based on experience. And um, I produce some object call or output called interp. Um, and then I can plot that up. And it's actually like pretty decent um, results. And you can see now I have this like 3D volume um, of, of points, or um, sorry, this 3D volume created um, by interpolating all those points. Um, and it's actually like fairly decent. And there's another example in the geo notebooks uh, that uh, runs through doing the same thing with creaking. Um, and if you're interested, I would recommend running through this notebook um, with this geostatistical example, it's the same data set, and then comparing the output to um, what was created with just a basic um, Gaussian kernel. Um, it's it's kind of uh, a fun little example. So I think that's about it for the basic examples. And I think now I want to run into the geo notebooks example um, and fly through those and uh, just show you what PyVista is capable of in a geoscientific context. Um, and so I'm going to start with this 1.0 geological cross-section example. And this came from our support forum, um, where a user was trying to um, plot uh, a, um, a geological cross-section from an image um, in a 3D environment. Um, and so I just, I'm going to fly through this. And you can sort of look at the code on your own time and pause the video and, and see what's going on. Um, but basically, we have a, um, a uh, um, I'm just going to go ahead and run through all of the code. And you can see here, like we have this 2D image um, that represents a geological cross-section that a geologist created. And we know that there's these um, three different points. And we know the z extent of the cross-section. And we can use that contextual knowledge to basically plot the geological cross-section in a 3D environment. And so maybe you have. Um, this geologic cross section, and you have all of your other sort of um, other spatial data. You can plot things like geological cross sections in the same three D environment. Um, another really common example in uh, in the geosciences is draping some sort of two D surface from a line. So this is where you can think of uh, things like G like two point five D. Uh, GPR sections, airborne EM profiles, or seismic data. And um, this was originally posted in a support issue. You can see the link there. Um, and I think this has also made its way into the PyVista docs. So I'm going to, again, just fly through this example and basically just show you the output so you um, can know what PyVista is capable of. Um, and so here, you can just see I loaded in some, um, some 2D array of data um, where it's uh, a GPR profile. And I can just plot that with matplotlib, and you can see Looks like that. And then I have some sort of path that we know it went through along the surface. Um, and uh, I just have all this code run through here just to show you how to create a pilot structured grid and, um, and plot the data up. And so here you can see I can overlay or I can plot a, a 2D surface of, um, of GPR data, um, a 2.5D surface of GPR data along some sort of line. So you know, you know, you drag your GPR machine. Um, over the surface on this path, and you have those saved from GPR co or GPS coordinates, um, and then you have the actual like 2D array um, that your GPR software output of the actual image, and maybe it's processed already, or maybe it isn't. But this um, just provides you a, a, a quick way of demoing how you can drape um, that sort of 2D surface or 2D array from some sort of line of points and create a 3D representation of your GPR data, seismic data. EM data or anything like that that, that kind of sort of comes in the standard 2.5D um, format. 
Um, another example I want to run through that's something cool that I think a lot of you might be interested in PyVista is this ability to pick horizons along data sets. Um, so again, I'm going to load that same GPR um, uh, data set here. And I'm just going to I'm going to run this outside of the notebook. Um, so previously throughout this workshop, I've been running all of the 3D plotting inside the notebook directly. I'm going to run this one outside the notebook just because the plotting features work a bit better outside the notebook. I'm just going to hit show. Um, and I'm going to um, And um, here is a PyVista window. Everything, my graphics seem to be a bit off from the screen sharing, but um, but um, I hope you all run this example yourself and hit the notebook equals false flag in here, um, and it will pop out a window. And what you can do then is um, there should be some text that displays, but it will say um, press P to select a point. And so I just selected one point right there along that um, sort of signal I'm seeing in my GPR profile. I'm going to select another one there, there there, there, and there. So I'm hitting P to make all these point selections. And you can see I'm selecting like a little horizon along my GPR profile. And so this is a way you can do horizon picking and start creating surfaces from um, all of your different sorts of geoscientific data. Um, and so like if, yeah, um, if you have something like GPR imagery and you want to pick different horizons and maybe come up with like a water table, um, then you can do that. And so now I can, I can close out a plotter and, um, I can access that picked horizon from the picked underscore horizon attribute on the plotter. So if I say um, p dot, you can see it's just this polydata object, and I can say, you know, let's assign this to a new variable, horizon equals that, um, and uh, I can now hit um, horizon dot plot, and we can see the actual horizon there. Um, yeah. Um, so that's a way you can do basic picking with PyVista um, to pick out different um, um, horizons and, and things like that. Um, I'm just going to shut down all these notebooks real quick and move on to um, showing how we can display geological maps on topography. And so in this example, I um, am just downloading a topography map and a um, geotiff. Um, and this geotiff is a fairly large um, image that so might take a while for you all to download. I already had it pre-downloaded. Um, and I just have some helper methods in here to basically get the spatial extent of the geotiff and, and figure out how to do um, the texture mapping of the geotiff onto the DM that I downloaded. Um, and so I want to just, whoops, sorry, I'm running into an error again. And so here you can see I have the spatial reference of the geotiff, this point U origin and point B coordinates. And then I have my DEM somewhere in the middle there. Um, and what I can do now is I can read the geotiff that I have as a texture in PyVista. And I can uh, pass it texture equals texture here with my topography mesh that I loaded and hit show. And we will see, um, you know, I set the camera position as something super zoomed in. But you can see now I have this, uh, this texture of a geological map and some aerial imagery overlaying my actual DEM. Cool. Um, uh, there's a few other examples here, and I highly recommend you all go through these yourselves and just sort of look at how you can create um, like a terrain following mesh from um, some DEM data. Um, I'm running into some technical issues on my end. Um, but, you know, in this case, I have some sort of uh, DEM surface. Um, I can warp that surface by a scalar and plot it. Um, so there's my um, DEM surface of the elevation model. Maybe I want to create a mesh that follows that surface. And so this example runs through how you can do that um, and create a structure grid of that and then plot it. And you can see here I have this terrain following mesh now. Um, and there's some other cool examples in here. This creating one's a really cool example, and this will take um, quite a few minutes to, to execute. But I, I really think it, this is a good exercise for people to run through just to show how PyVista is interoperable with other um, geoscientific libraries. Um, I see a question in the chat, and I'm going to transition now to trying to address all the questions in the chat. Um, so I see one on, um, is there an option to set the amount of vertical, vertical exaggeration? And there is. And inside this Geo Notebooks folder, there's an extra folder. And in there, um, there is a, um, 
Oops, sorry about that. Oh, nope, it's right here in Geo Notebooks 2.3 dash exaggeration. Um, and so in this notebook, I sort of walk through, um, I think, two different approaches to doing um, uh, vertical exaggeration. And so PyVista has a way of scaling the entire rendering scene. Um, oh, whoops. Um, so I just got to install an extra dependency for this notebook to run. Um, So in this example, I'm just going to um, um, load in some point data and a surface and uh, just load them up real quick. And so we can see here, like I have this DEM that has like very little Z variation compared to its XY extent. And so maybe you want to exaggerate the Z extent just so it's like it is a bit more visible of what's going on, like where the ranges are or like where the high values, high values and low values are. Um, so to do that, you want to add some vertical exaggeration. There's a few different ways to do this. Um, one of the easiest is adding is setting a scale on the plotter. So there's this set scale method where you can pass in either an X, Y, or Z scale. In this case, I'm going to add a vertical exaggeration of five. And I run that, and you can see now my plotter, everything in the scene is exaggerated um, 5x in the Z direction. And so you can see a bit more of the Z variation um, in the scene. And so that's one of the more common ways to um, um, set vertical exaggeration. Another really common way and easier sometimes is just to warp the mesh um, directly. And so maybe I have my surface mesh and I just plot it and you can see it. there's not a lot of variation. And so maybe I want to um, just say surface dot warp by scalar and um, and that will um, warp it in the z direction I think by default um, and uh, and uh, that's another way to provide sort of exaggeration if you only want to do one mesh at a time um, and I can set warp dot plot and you can see there's there's some variation and I can um, adjust the arguments to this. It's like factor equals um, five, and there you can see it looks very similar to our original uh, scene that got worked. Cool. So um, at this time, I'm I'm pretty much wrapped up, and uh, I'm just keeping an eye on the Slack channel. Um, and uh, if, if anyone has any questions, please tune in. If not, um, definitely you know take a look at the guide to PyVista for geoscientists that I have. Um, link to the GitHub repository, which walks you through, you know, uh, just a basic guide to PyVista, the data structures, all of that, um, how you can use PyVista in reproducible workflows. Um, and then in that example section, um, there are all of these examples where you can take a look um, at the code for, for producing these. Um, and so, you know, here's that um, geological map example where it runs through how to um, uh, how to do everything from the texture mapping to assigning the texture to the mesh and and performing the plot and all of that. Um, cool. So I'm keeping an eye on the Slack channel for any incoming questions. That is some pretty cool stuff, Bain. Um, what's what's sort of in the future for this project? That's uh, an excellent question. I guess so. Um, PyVista is beginning to reach somewhat of a stable state, and it's um, basically its goal was to make three D visualization in Python more approachable to domain scientists. And I think PyVista is reaching a point where that goal is um, near accomplished. Um, and so at this point, it, it's mostly um, providing user support and um, and basically just continuing to add um, new filters and, and helper routines to perform a lot of these 3D visualization tasks. But I think a lot of the core functionality um, that most domain scientists need out of a 3D visualization framework are encompassed in PyVista at this time. So I think moving forward for the project, it's just a lot of maintenance and um, providing user support on the PyVista support forum. 
Um, and I guess, you know, overall, PyVista, you know, its goal is to make 3D visualization more approachable, more easy for domain scientists. Um, so, you know, everything's super accessible with like, if you want to contour something, it's dot contour. If you want to plot something, it's dot plot, um, all of that. Um, so, um, so I think, you know, right now, that's you know where where PyVista is, and and um, moving forward, it's just a lot of support and um, helping users get up and running with PyVista and adding features as needed. Yeah, amazing. Well, um, I, the, I'm sure there'll be some more questions coming into the Slack, but I think we'll we'll leave the live stream there for now. You can jump into the Slack. Um, uh, well, later today or um, at your will, and uh, help people out there. But, you know, I, I mean, I can't speak on behalf of everyone, of course, but I think the community um, is just really appreciative that you and people like you and your colleagues on this project have put so much thought into how they can bring, you know, the amazing uh, VTK world to um, to scientists and create things that are really useful. So with hardly any code, you can do beautiful things uh, in the browser and with your data. So, you know, thank you very much for for showing us today how to get started with these things. Uh, it's really inspiring. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for watching. I uh, hope you've enjoyed this. Please uh, like and subscribe, as they say. You know, it's good to get feedback on what kinds of things the community uh, likes to see and learn about. And, um, you know, by all means, share this video with your friends who are struggling with scientific visualization. There will be more tutorials in Transform. Uh, there is one more later on today. Um, and there are some more on Thursday. So tune into those if uh, you're watching these kind of in the moment. Um, otherwise, we'll see you next time. Thanks again, Bain. Much appreciated and great job today. And uh, we'll see you all again soon. Thanks, Thank Matt. And thanks, everyone, for tuning in. I will try to address any follow-up questions on the Slack channel. and and then point everybody to the PyVista support forum for um, further follow-up questions. Wonderful. Thanks, Bain.